Hi class, today we're going to talk about chapter 25, Alexander the Great from the story of the world. In this video, we're going to review chapter 25, talk about um, Sparta and Athens after the Peloponnesian War, King Philip of Macedon, Alexander the Great, the Diodici, and then the Hellenistic period. So let's start with your chapter 25 review. Uh, this chapter was in three different sections, and the first section is named Philip and his son, and in this section you learn that Philip was the king of Macedonia, which is a country north of Greece. He saw that the Greeks were really weak after fighting the Peloponnesian War, and so he goes and he conquers the Greek cities. After that, he's just like, hmm, what else can I conquer? And so he tries to take over the Persian Empire, but he died before he could do that. So then Alexander the Great, who's Philip's son, becomes king. And he is able to tame a horse that no one else could tame, and he names him Bucephalus. You guys read about how he cuts the Gordian knot, and then he conquers Asia, Egypt, and the Persian Empire. And he ruled the largest empire the world had ever seen. Here is a picture of Alexander the Great cutting the Gordian knot. And then in the second section, you read about Alexander's invasions. So he goes and he tries to conquer India, but his army just mutinies. They're like, we have had enough of this. And so Alexander the Great has to give up, but he really wanted to be remembered. And so he built cities and then named them Alexandria. Um, Alexandria in Egypt is the most famous of these cities and Alexandria becomes um, the greatest city in the world. It becomes the center of art, music, and learning. And Pharos is a lighthouse that was about 330 feet tall that was built in Alexandria and considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Now, in your book, it said that um, the remains of this lighthouse may have been discovered in the ocean, and I couldn't find an uncopyrighted picture to put in this slideshow, but if you Google like Pharaoh's lighthouse um, remains or Pharaoh's lighthouse in the ocean or something like that, you can see pictures. There's also some YouTube videos of people diving and looking at these remains. Uh, in the third section, you read about the death of Alexander. So Alexander the Great had become king at the age of 20. Then he conquered the known world in 11 years. And then he dies at the age of 32 or 33, depending on the source that you're looking at. No one knows why he died. Um, there's a lot of different theories. And then his generals divide up his kingdom because he had not named an heir. So one general takes over Macedonia and the northern part of Asia Minor. Uh, Ptolemy I takes over Egypt and his family rules for 300 years. And then Seleucus takes over the southern part of Asia Minor and the land in Asia, and his descendants would become the Syrians. So the time of peace that Alexander had tried to bring about was over, and these generals and their descendants would then fight for the next hundred years. Okay, so let's take a look at Sparta and Athens after the Peloponnesian War. So Athens after the war not doing so great. Uh, Susan Weisbauer says the war between Athens and Sparta was over. Athens was desolate, broke, angry, the long walls ripped down, and as many as 70,000, that's a lot, 70,000 Athenians dead through plague, war, or political purge. No one had a plan for the future. Like, what are we doing now? Like, all these people are dead. And the city was filled with widows and women who would never marry because so many men had died. Aristophanes gives bitter voice to the times in his play. Remember, Aristophanes is the father of comedy. Um, but in his play, The Assembly Woman, the situation can, can yet be saved, a woman of Athens proclaims. I propose that we hand over the running of Athens to the woman. Now, I know we look back at this and we're just like, fine, let the woman figure it out. But this is a comedy, so it was like a comedic thought to be like, hand it over to the woman. But like, it rings to the truth of there were no, there were hardly any men left to even run the city. Uh, Sparta after the war um, is also not doing so great. So Susan Weisbauer says Sparta, the nominal victor, was a little better off. Planting and harvesting had been thrown entirely off schedule. The army storming through the Peloponnese had crushed vines, flattened olive trees, and killed flocks. More and more Spartans despaired of feeding themselves at home and became mercenaries instead. Thousands of these Spartans went to work for the Persian royal family. 
So I want you to think of like the irony in this, that Sparta and Athens had come together and fought off this huge empire and emerged victorious. And then they turn on each other, fight each other. And when all is said and done, they're so weakened that the Spartans have to go and work for the empire that they had fought off. Like, I don't know. It's just sad. So that leads us to King Philip of Macedon or Macedonia, and he reigned 359 to 336 BC. So Macedonia uh, is a country north of Greece at this time, and Macedonia is a monarchy. That means it's ruled by one king. Macedonia is a very weak country. They have a very undisciplined army, and the Greeks are looking at these Macedonians, and they consider them to be very backwards and primitive. They look, and they're like, oh, look at them. They're living in villages and not cities. And you guys know from our study of the polis and the acropolis, like, the, the Greek city-state, their polis was so important to who they were that looking at these people living in villages was like, oh, well, they're just uncivilized. Um, the Greeks also thought that the Macedonians were only useful as a source of timber and pasture land. Um, also, the Macedonians spoke a form of Greek that the Greeks didn't understand very well. And because of this, they thought it, it sounded barbaric in a sense because they didn't speak correct Greek. In 359 BC, King Philip took the throne or he comes to the throne and he began reforming his country. And one of the first reforms that he makes is in his army. So he reorganizes and increases the size of his army and his cavalry. And then he makes a separate corps of engineers to create siege weaponry, kind of like we saw happen in Assyria. And then King Philip adopted and restructured the Greek phalanx um, by adding a commander to each unit. He also gives them like longer spears. Um, but basically he says here, this is your unit and he gives each unit a commander so that there's better communication um, between the units. Then he says, okay, I'm going to reform my city. So he remakes the capital of Pella and then he starts inviting important people like writers and philosophers and poets to come visit his city. And one of these people he asks to come is Aristotle, who we know is a great Greek philosopher. And Aristotle was asked to come to tutor Philip's son, Alexander. So understand that Alexander was brought up with a Greek education, learning Greek ideas and Greek thought and Greek philosophy through Aristotle. So um, King Philip also invites the sons of neighboring countries to study in Pella, like come send your sons, study here. And one of the reasons he did this was to ensure that these neighboring countries wouldn't attack, which is smart because like what neighboring country is gonna be like, let's attack this country that our sons are, are studying in. Um, so uh, it was a smart thing to do. And then he sets, out, sets off to conquer Greece. So the Greek city-states were still really weak from fighting um, after the Peloponnesian War. So Philip campaigns into Greece and he takes one city at a time. Remember, Greeks are uh, Greek is not unified. And so you can't just go to the capital and take the capital, right? Like you have to go and get every city. Um, and when Athens was attacked at the Battle of Chironia, uh, Sparta refuses to come help Athens because Sparta is still really bitter over the war, even though they won. Um, so this battle is when Philip had his son Alexander command one of the wings. I think he was still like 17 or something, but he has him command one of the wings um, as they're fighting the Athens. And Alexander was the first one to break through the lines um, of the Athenians. Susan Weiss Bauer says the Battle of Chironia was remarkable for two things. This first, this was Alexander's first try at major military command, like first time doing this, and he's the first one to break through the lines. And it marked an end to an era. The Greek city states would never again be free from the bonds of empire. So that's a little sad to me. Like this is it. This marks the time when Greek city states would never again function as city states. They would always be confined to the bonds of empire. So we have to ask like what was Philip's motive for conquering Greece? 
So King Philip wanted to absorb Greece into his empire. He didn't just want to conquer it. He wanted Greece to be a part of his country, his empire. He wanted the Greeks um, to be loyal. He wanted their allegiance to his throne. He wants to merge his country together with Greece. So after he conquers the Athens, he treats them with really great respect. He releases the prisoners to go home and he helps the dead to be sent back to the city in an honorable way. And the Athenians in turn look and uh, Susan Weisbauer says the Athenians, making the best of a bad situation, chose to pretend that Philip was now the friend of Athens. Again, because they, they both do speak Greece, Greek, so they're not like completely, completely foreign, if that makes sense. Anyway, so then this leads to the creation of, a, of the Corinthian League. So yes, we're going to study another league. Uh, Susan Weisbauer says the following year, Philip made a speech at Corinth suggesting that Greek submission to his kingship would be good for Greece. Sparta still refused to have anything to do with Philip's plan. But the rest of the Greek cities agreed with Philip's army standing nearby naturally. So you have Philip's army standing nearby and Philip makes a speech saying like, you should submit to me. And, the, and Greece is like, yes, yes, of course we will. And the soldiers are all there, of course. Uh -huh. And so anyway, the rest of the Greek cities agreed to join together in yet another Greek league. This was called the Corinthian League. And like the old Delian League, it was formed with the intent of attacking the Persians. Unlike the Delian League, it had the king of Macedonia at its supreme, um, as its a supreme commander. So you had the Delian League who wanted to defend themselves for the Persians, but also push them back more. And now you have the Corinthians League, which all this, all the um, Greek city states except for Sparta are a part of. Um, but now they have the king of Macedonia as the leader and not Athens. So then Philip is just like, okay, I got my soldiers and now I have all of Greece's soldiers as well. So he begins plotting to attack the Persian Empire. But then this is when he's assassinated in 336 BC. And Alexander becomes king at the age of 20. And when I think about this, like I'm 30 right now, but like I was still in college at age 20. Like if you guys go to college, you'll be in college at the age of 20. Like I can't really even fathom ruling a country at that age. But anyway, so when he comes to the throne, uh, Alexander was half Greek uh, due to his mother. And some people had objected to his becoming the Macedonian king. They were like, Philip, you need to produce like a pure Macedonian heir. So there's a little tension there. Susan Weisbauer says um, he inherited, Plutarch says, a kingdom surrounded on all sides by bitter resentment, deep hatred, and danger. The conquered territories to the north, which is like Thrace, um, were unhappy under Macedonian rules. The Greeks to the south were not so fully resigned to their Corinthian League membership that Alexander could afford to rely on them. Um, and the Persians were waiting for the Macedonians to attack. And so it's a lot of stuff he has to deal with at the age of 20 as he becomes the king. So let's talk about some of those things. So Alexander the Great, he reigns from 336 to 323 BC. And so as he becomes king, almost immediately the Greek cities declare that they were now no longer part of the Corinthian League. Like best time honestly to revolt is when you have a change in leadership. And they did that. So then Alexander goes and he starts reconquering all these different cities as he marches down to Thebes. He gets to Thebes and he is like, hey guys, if you hand over the two people who were responsible for saying that they didn't want to be part of the Corinthian League and trying to withdraw your membership, then I'll let you go free and easy. Just hand over those two people. And Thebes refused to hand over those leaders who decided to secede from the league. And Alexander is like, fine, if you're going to act that way, I'm going to make an example of you. And he destroys them and he just burns down the city. He kills 6,000 of them and 30,000 of the Thebians are sold into slavery. It, yeah. So when he when he gets to Athens, Athens is like, please take our leaders who said this. And they, they sent them off. But Athens is OK because they hand off the leaders. And then he's just like, okay, 
I got Greece under my submission. Now let's go to Egypt. So in 331 BC, Alexander arrives in Egypt and the Egyptians don't even try to resist. Like they've been under Persian war rule for a long time. And so now they're like, here's another conqueror. And they're like, here, we're going to just crown you Pharaoh. We're not even going to try to fight. And this is when he find, founds the city of Alexandria. Um, and again, this city would become the city of culture and learning for centuries. And the lighthouse of Pharaohs uh, pictured here um, is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And Alexandria would house the largest library of the ancient world, which makes me so happy because I just I love books and I love libraries. So then he's like, I got Greece, I got Egypt, now let's go to Persia. So between 334 and 331 BC, Alexander set out to conquer the Persian Empire and thus fulfill his father's dream because his father was the one who always wanted to conquer the Persian Empire. So he sets out with his army and this army has 32,000 in, 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 in his infantry and 5,100 in his cavalry. So a lot. Um, and we're not going to get into detail, but he fought many, 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 many battles. And eventually he defeats King Darius III. Um, he also destroys the Persian capital. And as he does this, he ends the Achaemenid Empire started by King Cyrus. Alexander became the absolute ruler in Persia. So then he's like, okay, let's keep going. So in 327 BC, Alexander enters into India and he fought many different Indian leaders and he's actually able to conquer a few of them. Uh, one of the leaders he conquers is named Porus and Porus fought so bravely that after Alexander conquered him, he put him in charge of a larger region than he had held before. Um, but this is the battle or uh, when Alexander's horse, Bucephalus, died, and he named one of the cities he founded right after this battle, Bucephala. So Alexander just wants to keep going into India. He's already conquered Persia, the Persian Empire, and he's gone further into Asia, and he wants to go further into India, but his troops are like, nope, we're done. And so they mutinied against him and Alexander goes and he pouts for a while and but like he can't do anything. So he was forced to go. He was forced to go home. So here is a map of all that Alexander had conquered. Like this is crazy. So here's Egypt down here with the Nile. Um, here is modern day Israel. You have Asia Minor. So remember, this was like where Lydia was and like the Ionian cities that had rebelled. This is Macedonia right here and Thrace. And you have Greece, as you can see, Sparta is just left out right there. Um, and you just have all this Persian Empire and even all the way down as you try to get into uh oops, India and deeper into Asia. Like, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of territory. But Alexander's empire, again, was the largest the world had ever seen, but he did not rule it for very long because in 323 BC, he became ill while he was in Babylon. And a few days later, he died of unknown causes at the age of 32 or 33, again, depending on the source, without naming an heir. Now, just as a side note, he had two wives when he died who were pregnant at this time. One of them uh, ends up killing the other. And the one who had the baby, Alexander IV, was later killed with her son. So any potential heir basically was killed. Which leads us to the Diodici, I think. That's how you say it. <laughs> um, so Alexander's empire, again, because he didn't name an heir, he wasn't planning on dying at the age of 32. So Alexander's empire was divided between his generals who were known as the Diodici or the successors. Um, so one of them was Cassander. Uh, Cassander was the one that would have Alexander's wife and his son, Alexander IV, and his mother executed to secure his title as the new king of Macedonia. However, and Antigonus would take it over later. So Antigonus, the second on the list, would take over Macedonia and Greece. Ptolemy became king, uh, the pharaoh of Egypt, and his family would reign for 300 years. Cleopatra was the last descendant. And Seleucus founded the Seleucid Empire, which encompassed Mesopotamia, Anatolia, and parts of India. And he is the last one of the Diodici after years of war um, 
to last, or I'm sorry, the last duchy after years of war between generals and their heirs. So here's a map, as you can see, of just the different generals and the sections that they took. And all these would just be fighting for a while. Joshua J. Mark uh, at the at Ancient History Encyclopedia says, the Diodici's influence over the regions they controlled con created what historians refer to as the Hellenistic period, in which Greek thought and culture became entwined with that of the indigenous populace. That just means that Greek ideas would mingle with like the people who had originally lived there. And, and their ideas and culture. One of the stipulations of Alexander's will was the creation of a unified empire between former empires. People of the Near East were to be encouraged to marry those of Europe and those of Europe to do likewise. In so doing, a new culture would be embraced by all. Uh, although the Diodici failed in the peaceful fulfillment of his wishes through the Hellenization of their empires, they contributed to Alexander's dream of cultural unity, even if such unity could never be fully realized. Let's talk about this Hellenistic period. So do you guys remember when we talked about um, Greek history, we studied how Greek history is divided into these following time periods. Um, you have like Minoan, Mycenaeans, and then you have the Bronze Age collapse, and then you have the Greek Dark Ages caused by the Bronze Age collapse where we have no writing, uh, so we don't know a lot about it. And then we emerge from that into the Archaic period where you have Homer writing down the tales from the Iliad and the Odyssey, and he can do this because you have the invention of the alphabet. You have the beginnings of the Olympics, the creation of the polis or the Greek city-states, and the Persian Wars are fought during the Archaic period. Greek emerges victorious over the Persians, and this brings us into the classical period. We have further developments of the city-states like Sparta and Athens, and Athens building the Parthenon, and you have all of these um, Greek philosophers, and you also have Herodotus and these people, um, these famous people that we look back on today, uh, and then you also have the Peloponnesian Wars that are fought. And after this, you go into what's known as the Hellenistic period, where you have Alexander, um, which goes from Alexander the Great's death to Rome conquering Greece. So that's the chunk of time. This is also the chunk of time where Aristotle lived. And so classical period is done. We're moving into the Hellenistic period. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So again, in only 11 years, Alexander created the largest empire in the world. Um, up to that time and he was in doing so he brought different people groups together and so this helps create kind of this new culture that we look back and, and call Hellenistic or which means Greek-like because different cultures started mixing with Greek culture and this is called Hellenization where you're making things Greek-like, more Greek. Um, so this time period, the Hellenistic time period, spreads Greek culture and ideas such as philosophy or even democracy and language. Uh, this ensured the survival of the qualities of classical Greeks, which is really important. Like these ideas could have just died out, but they didn't. They spread. And so then this becomes a time of um, advances in learning and math and art and architecture. And also travel and trade increase as these places are more unified and people start sharing um, a common culture and start sharing more of a common language because Greek, Greek becomes um, more widely spoken. Um, this is from uh, Ancient History Encyclopedia YouTube video, but um, this is just a quote on Hellenization. But this video says, Hellenization lay the foundation of the development of the modern age by introducing common culture and language throughout the ancient world during the fourth century BC. And I want you to just stop and think about that for a second, that you have Greek ideas and and their their culture forming, and because of Alexander the Great conquering all of this region, um, you have uh, Hellenization and, be and Hellenization and things becoming Greek-like and this culture spreading lays the foundation of the development of the modern age. 
and we've talked about Western civilization, but this is this is a uh, really important concept that I want you guys to grasp. Um, next part of the quote, it also enabled greater cross-cultural transmission and advances in technology, religion, and other aspects of civilization. At the same time, Hellenization disrupted the progress of the cultures it unified by introducing and elevating Greek customs and language at the expense of the indigenous cultural values. So basically what that's saying is, yes, Hellenization spread Greek thought and language and culture and architecture, and you have these advances in technology and other aspects of civilization, but at the same time, it was at the expense of stopping the progress of these other cultures. So I want you to write and tell me, do you think Hellenization was a good thing or do you think it was a bad thing for disrupting the progress of these different cultures? So write your answer. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.